And in the busy bags, in the Arthrex, for the young kids, there's exactly the same amount of stuff that you have. <laughs> Today we heard the text about Jonah. And I love that text. It is a perfect example of life in this world. And connected with this particular gospel text, we've got a powerful lesson about generosity, about grace. And so for those of you who may not have read the story of Jonah for some time, the, the entire story, I'm going to just give a real quick background. God called Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to preach repentance and forgiveness. Jonah was an Israelite. He was called to go to Nineveh, the capital city of the enemy, to preach repentance and forgiveness. In current day, Nineveh would be close to Mosul in northern Iraq. And so Jonah put his tail between his legs and he ran west, the opposite direction. I do not want to go talk to the enemy about repentance and forgiveness. And so he ran. And he jumped on a ship to head towards Europe. And during the time that he was on the ship, a storm comes up. And the sailors on the ship asked him if he knew anything about why this bad luck of the storm would have come upon them. And Jonah tells them, it's my fault that the storm has come up because I'm running from God. And they're looking at him and saying, you're a crazy man. Running from God? How can you do that? Can you ever really run from God? So he said, throw me overboard and the storm will cease. And so they did. They threw him overboard. Although they did take some time to think about it before it was done. So they threw him overboard. He's swallowed by a fish for three days before being spit out where he repents and he goes to Nineveh. And so Jonah travels to Nineveh and he preaches repentance and forgiveness and this huge city, which was one of the largest cities in the world at that time, the city typically followed the order of the king. The king heard the message that Jonah preached, and the king said, everyone in this city will repent and will turn to this God of Jonah, and he'll do it because I said so. And so the city of Nineveh repented. And God changed his mind about the punishment that he was going to put upon Jonah's enemy. How did Jonah react? Just like you and I would probably react. I would rather be dead. I ran on purpose because I knew that you, God, would be a gracious God that you would show forgiveness upon my enemies, and I don't want to see it. And so God puts this little tree over Jonah overnight to shade him from the heat of, the, of that area, and the next morning, God takes the tree away, and then Jonah complains about not having a tree anymore. And that's the end of the story. We don't know what happened to Jonah. <clears throat> he may have gone on being a grumpy old man for the rest of his life. We don't know. But the story is, the theme of this story, well, one of many themes of this story, is that God's forgiveness transcends ours. And 
he calls us to continuously be praying for enemies, be praying for others, to forgive. So we've got that story in front of us. Before we read this parable that Jesus tells about the business owner who makes a contract with a bunch of people at early in the morning to work for him throughout the day in the vineyard. And the people agreed to the amount that he was going to pay. They said yes to it and they went and they started working all day. And then a few hours later, the owner goes out to the marketplace. He sees that there are still people looking for work. He's got work. And so he goes out and he pulls a few more people in. And a few hours later, he goes and gets a few more. And even up to an hour before the end of the day, the owner goes out, he sees people that are still unemployed, and so he calls them in to work for, to at least get an hour of work in for the day. And at the end of the day, the owner gives the same amount of pay to all of the people, no matter how long they have been there. Well, that just doesn't make sense, does it? Really? The person that worked here for an hour is getting the same amount as the people who've been here since 8 o'clock in the morning? How does that work? <coughs> it talks about how the Christian message is so countercultural to what we know today. All that we know in this world is you get what you deserve. You have to earn what you get. And that is not the way grace works. That is not the way generosity works. In the text, there's a verse that says, Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, the owner? Or are you envious because I am generous? Why do we care what the other people are getting paid? What difference does it make to my life? In the original Greek, that sentence, are you envious because I am generous? The original Greek sentence literally says, is your eye evil because I am good? The Gospel of Matthew refers to the evil eye in chapter 6 when Matthew writes about the eye is the lamp of the body. So if the eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, and if it is unhealthy, your body is full of darkness. Have you ever talked to someone in conversation and looked them in the eyes? There's a saying that the eyes are the windows of the soul. It's a very vulnerable position to be talking to somebody eye to eye. You don't have the ability to cover things up with your voice or with facial expressions or with body language. People are looking into your soul through the eyes. There's a connection there that's unexplainable, but you know it's there. You know that there is a certain personal type of connection that is not felt in any other time when you are looking somebody in the eyes and communicating with them. Often, words don't even have to be shared as communication happens eye to eye. It's that layer of vulnerability that makes us wonder, will somebody see something that I don't want them to see? when they're looking into my soul? Is there something that I'm trying to hide? Is there a reason that I can't look eye to eye that I have to look away during a conversation? 
Or maybe there's something that you want someone else to see within you. Maybe there's a part of your soul that you want others to see that just doesn't seem to be coming out in day-to-day -day actions and activities. Maybe you're inviting someone to look into your eyes to see the real you. What if you could look into God's eyes? What do you think you would see if you could look into God's very soul? I wonder if it would be almost as uncomfortable looking into God's soul as it would be to have someone looking into mine when I have things I prefer not to share. Because maybe there are parts of God's soul that make me uncomfortable too. We may not like the generosity that God shows without partiality. We may not like the idea that God loves everyone regardless of what they have earned or what they believe they deserve. We might cringe at the grace that God would give to those who we deem unworthy. We might be uncomfortable when God shows grace to our enemies like he did with Jonah. How can we possibly grasp this concept of grace, of generosity, when we are using our own flawed lenses to determine worthiness? Why do we care? what the others got paid. What difference is it to those who worked the full day and agreed to the pay that they got? We live in a world that believes we must earn everything, including generosity. When given an unexpected gift, what is our typical reaction? What did I do to deserve that? Deserve. I'll pay you back. You gotta have equality. I'll be sure to put them on my list next year for a gift. grace or generosity when something needs to be done in response to the gift. The people of Nineveh didn't deserve God's grace of forgiveness in the eyes of Jonah. They had persecuted and controlled the Israelites for generations. But if grace had been deserved, then is it really grace? Generosity? Or is it earned equality? You know, when you get what you deserve. Thank God for the grace that he showed to the Ninevites, because it is the same grace that was given to you and I through Jesus Christ. And thank God for the generosity to the laborers, because while it's easy to think of ourselves as those who came at 8 o'clock in the morning and deserve our salvation, we are in fact the people who were hired during the last hour of the day, who are not deserving of the Master's generosity. No matter how often it is said that we cannot earn or deserve God's grace, we still assume that we do. It's our 
human sin that wants to compare our imperfect selves to imperfect others to try to justify our worthiness. But thankfully, Jesus pours out divine grace beyond our imagination to all of us. And in sharing compassion to others, we can get a small glimpse of his love and his desire for relationship with each and every one of us. Even though it's undeserved. Amen. Please stand.